Hi guys, Andrew here again, your loved one lawyer. I've noticed that many of my clients ask me about the procedures, the steps of incorporating a loved one company. As such, I'd like to share with you today a step-by-step -step procedure in relation to the incorporating of loved one companies. Now, you have the required documents. If you are a Malaysian, of course, you can provide us with your identity card. If you're a foreigner, please provide us with your passport. And why the documents that I have listed down? It is uh, for bank, personal bank statements. We require it so that we could validate the person, right? And uh, of course, the a loved one company can be 100% owned by a foreigner with at least one director and shareholder. Now, filling up of required forms, most trust companies would prepare a pre-incorporation form for a client to fill up. So, it mainly indicates the choices of names that you would like to name your company, your directors, and the structure of your shareholding. The next would be what is done behind the scene. Well, trust companies will be reserving your company name for you the preparation of various documents that is to be signed by the directors and shareholders, the operational office in Labuan, and of course, the main important one, which is the bank account opening. The timeline for the incorporation of a Labuan company would usually take three to five working days, which is fairly fast, However, the opening of a bank account, um, it could take up to months, but in, for the minimum, it is three to four weeks after the incorporation of the company. Voila, you have a successfully incorporated company and at the, uh, upon successful incorporation, you'll be provided with the certificate of incorporation of course and together with all the relevant documents that you require to show your clients or whatnot. After the incorporation of your company, the next important matter would be the account opening, bank account opening of course. It can take to up to two months, it can be daunting at times but we will surely guide you. I would like to take this opportunity to tell you more about what is Substance Requirement Rule. If you have observed, I have mentioned this phrase a couple of times in my previous videos. And to put it in a layman term, I would say that if your company could not fulfill the Substance Requirement Rule or you are not listed as one of the company that needs to fulfill the substance requirement rule then you will need to be taxed in accordance with our income tax act of malaysia now what i would like to show you is the tax substance requirement well, these are the, a list of entities that can fulfill the substance requirement and they would be entitled to 3% tax. So you can, if you could see here, uh, we have the Lab1 insurer, Lab1 reinsurers, Lab1 underwriters, uh, insurance companies generally, and uh, you have Labuan International Commodity Trading, 
Labuan Banks, Labuan Trust Company like uh, AAE, Labuan Leasing Company, Credit Token, and many more. Then we have the item 21, which is holding company and what we are discussing today. In Labuan, we differentiate pure equity and non-pure equity holding companies. As for pure equity companies, they are not required to have at least one staff being employed in Labuan and you have a minimum, but you have a minimum spend of 20,000 ringgit per annum. As for the non-pure equity companies, you are required to have at least one staff in Labuan and an expenditure in Labuan for at least 20,000 ringgit. Of course, one would ask me if you are not listed in the substance requirement rule, how else would you pay your tax? This slide would explain that. Corporate tax in Malaysia is as such, as you can see the slide here, 17% and in excess of 600 ringgit, 600,000 ringgit, you will be paying at a rate of 24%. And of course, uh, this 24% tax is taxable on net chargeable income. One would ask me, Hey Andrew, if I'm not enjoying 3% tax, what are the advantages of a Labuan company? For one, I would say that a Labuan company can apply for a work permit and its regulations and policies are rather straightforward and simple. Secondly, a trading company can retain cash received from their customer in major currency. So what does that mean? If you have a client that is paying you in US dollars, you would be able to keep it in US dollar as opposed to an onshore company, which is, for instance, a Sandem Berhad or a private limited company in Malaysia, you will not be able to retain those US dollars fully in your bank account. And only 30% of those cash received can be retained in US dollars. So you would be losing a lot in your currency conversion rates.